of the Swiss Arts Council, Pro Helvetia, I would like to welcome you to our press conference at the Architecture Biennale 2014. Uh, we are completely overwhelmed by this what is happening today here, and I'm very much looking forward now to introduce our today's colleagues and guests. Uh, first of all, uh, we have here Maya Hoffmann from the Luma Foundation, we have Marion Burki from the Swiss Arts Council. Marian and me, we are the commissioners. We will guide you a bit through this conference. And then we have Jacques Herzog from Herzog Dömeron Architects. And we have our curator, Hans Ulrich Obrist. So now I would like to pass my words to Marian Burki. Please, Marian. Thank you very much for this introduction. Thank you very much to everybody to be here. We are very excited to be here for the stroll through a fun palace. Uh, the Swiss Pavilion curated this year by Hans Ulrich Obrist, whom I want to thank here very much. It's a pleasure to see the, the whole pavilion moving, changing in a dramaturgy. Uh, constantly building new knowledge and new exchanges, so I'm extremely happy to be here. Um, I would like to welcome all the journalists uh, here, um, and of course we will be here also for questions after, after um, the introduction. Um, a big thank you for the beginning. This is a huge project, as you can imagine. Um, it was also made possible by Luma Foundation, and a big thank you to Maya Hoffman, who is sitting next to me. Um, also, I am happy to thank the SEO Foundation, who helped us to bring so many students here in the pavilion, so they can uh, build the knowledge about the two archives, uh, Cedric uh, Price and Lucius Burkhardt. Thanks also to Vitra, to CCA, and of course the Lucius and Annemarie Burkhardt Stiftung. Um, just a little uh, note to the schedule. Um, Hansel Rikobrist will right now introduce the project to you in depth. Um, then we have the pleasure to have Jacques Herzog here with us. He will also talk about the part um, Herzog and Dömeron contributed to the whole projects and then uh, of course uh, we will all be available for for questions uh, as well um, in just before the questions we have Maya Hoffman presenting her engagement uh, in this uh, very important uh, project so thank you very much um, and I just am very happy to hand over to Hans Ulrich Obrist Marianne and Sandy, thank you very, very much. Um, it is a great honor to be invited by Pro Helvetia to curate the Swiss Pavilion for the Venice Architecture Biennale uh, and celebrate here the work of Lucius Burkhardt and Cedric Price. It is also a dream come true to be here with Jacques Herzog. It was uh, when I was a teenager growing up in Switzerland that actually uh, B.J. Corrigan introduced me to Jacques and Pierre, who were the first architects I ever met in my life. So. Um, we can really say everything started with Herzog Dömeron. It's in that very first meeting that Jacques and Pierre, actually Jacques emphasized that I should look at Lucius. Um, and uh, uh, somehow um, when the invitation came from this uh, Pro and the idea also to actually do something in relation to Rem Kolas' overall theme and the idea that it's uh, about these moments of the 20th century to be revisited, it felt like a great opportunity to make this uh, sort of protagonist Lucius Burkhardt more known because he remains very little known out of Switzerland and outside Germany where he's known. Very few of his books are translated. Born in 1925, he was a political economist, a sociologist, an architectural thinker and a planning theorist. He stated that architecture must contemplate the environmental and social circumstances which by far outweigh the visible environment. And that's also true for Cedric Price whose architecture potential to nurture change, intellectual growth and social development is at the core of his practice. So we decided to call the exhibition a stroll through a fun palace, celebrating two of the many great inventions of Cedric and Lucius. Cedric, of course, with the fun palace, with this extraordinary um, unrealized uh, institute, he, uh, cultural institution he invented 
together with John Littlewood and many other practitioners, so working with cybernetician Gordon Pask, working with people from the world of music, all fields, and it's very much the way that we conceived the palace, Fun Palace, is an inspiration for what we did in this pavilion here. Lucius Burkhardt, among his many inventions, uh, invented astrology. He actually made the science of going on a walk an academic discipline uh, in Kassel. Uh, and so um, you will see basically both works have a lot to do with drawings uh, and we thought actually with Jacques and Pierre it would be wonderful to show this archive of drawings of Cedric and Lucius at the center here of the Swiss pavilion. Now one of the things which was interesting is that already in the 90s when I then became actually was in dialogue with Cedric and Lucius a lot, I did exhibitions of their work at the Musée d'Art Moderne de la Ville de Paris and more and more looking at their drawings they seemed very very similar. So this idea of actually having this comparative study here through drawing is at the origin of the pavilion. We are very grateful to Mirko Zardini of uh, CCA in Canada who is here who um, uh, curated with us the Cedric Price part um, and uh, we'll speak later tonight about uh, the Cedric archive. And then, of course, we were wondering how could one actually develop an archive as a lively thing? Because this idea of drawings, of architecture, of sketches uh, can sometimes be, and also of a lot of text, can be quite difficult for an exhibition visitor, both in the architecture world and outside the architecture world, to transmit. So we felt it's urgent to actually involve artists and architects in that. And together with Herzog Demeron and also Atelier Bauer, who built the roof here, it's an homage to Cedric Price's aviary, we started to involve artists. Uh, with our scientific director, whom I thank so much, uh, Lorenzo Baroncelli, um, we developed a team involving Liam Gillick, Dominic Gonzalez Förster, uh, the artist Sorotea von Hantelmann, the art historian, Philip Pareno and Tino Segal, the artist, and started to meet regularly. And these meetings happened in Basel, uh, in the office of Herzog de Meron, and really were about this idea of how one could come up with a format of an exhibition, with a choreography. And it's really Tino Segal, Asad Raza as well, and uh, also Philip, who developed the kind of overall choreography with Herzog de Meron. The kind of first uh, key idea were the trolleys, because we went to the archive of Lucius, and suddenly the librarians started to move these trolleys around. And that gave Jacques and Pierre the idea of using these trolleys as a display feature. So when you come in the morning to the pavilion, the pavilion, as opposed to now, is completely empty. And when you're the first visitors, it's like a bit like Le Vide et Le Plain in Yves Klein and Armand. It's kind of both. You enter the pavilion and it's completely empty and then suddenly a trolley shoots out and there start to be conversations. So that's the idea which we had with the ETH students, also with the office of uh, Herzog de Meron, um, but as well, of course, with many other uh, universities and art schools and architecture schools all over the world, with Lorenza Baroncelli and Stefano Boeri, who directs this school, to develop actually a permanent presence of students and young architects here. And that had to do with an experience actually I had previously with laboratory exhibitions where very often we you know, made them very, very active at the opening and then everybody left and it felt you know, the laboratory had, had left town. So we wanted to hear for the entire duration of the six months in Venice, develop actually an ongoing laboratory. There will always be around 10 students here uh, and the visitors will always be engaged in conversation and after one trolley, many more trolleys come out during the days and it's possible to see this archive in a, as a sort of a living archive, really. The same thing with the musical chairs. They are not here now because we have the press conference, but normally in this space here are the musical chairs where we have these panels, and I'm sure Jacques will tell us about this later, the panels on which the archives are. We are also very grateful to all the artists who made contributions for this choreography, which pop up every now and then. Olafur Eliasson, Dan Graham, Carsten Höller, uh, Rike Tiravanisha, and of course also the scholar Samantha Hardingham uh, and Eleanor Braun, uh, Cedric's very, very old friend who contributed so much to the pavilion. We are extremely grateful to the Luma Foundation. It's a co-production of Pohil Fez and the Luma Foundation and to Maya Hoffman because this adventure here is very, very connected to an exhibition uh, we developed in Arles uh, with uh, Maya and the Luma Core Group, with uh, Beatrix Ruf and Tom Eccles and Philip Pareno and Liam Gillick, where actually the idea was to present the models of Frank Gehry as a choreography. And this exhibition is still ongoing, and it's again a collaboration where, you know, Philip Pareno, uh, 
Asadraza, Liam, are, are very involved. So this idea of actually showing architecture in a different way, in a dialogue between art and architecture, and that's obviously again very inspired by Jacques. And I remember again in that first meeting when I visited Jacques for the first time, he told me about the almost immaterial collaboration with Remy Zauk, thinking about formats with Remy. Uh, and so that has a lot to do with what is happening here. The students who are here is a collaboration also with the Steo Foundation uh, in Zurich, so uh, who made possible this idea that really students can be here and spend time in Venice. And that also will mean, you know, there are going to be many more theses, books on Cedric and Lucius. So the pavilion really becomes um, a research, a research uh, center. So thank you all again very, very much. Thank you very much. Now I would like to pass uh, the word to Jacques to, to explain the part of the project. Well, gladly, um, Hans Ulrich, you said so much, so there is not so much left to, to say. And you, you describe pretty well what um, you can see here. And um, Pierre and I were invited indeed by you, Hans Ulrich, not for the first time to collaborate with you in a project which always so far has turned out to be quite successful at least in, a, in, a, in how we can see it and how we can witness it and how it turned out for ourselves um, as a pleasure both intellectually but also physically so that you enjoy it and people also like it because people understand it it's not just a purely intellectual uh, kind of um, um, trip, but it's something that you really take something with you. And I think that's the goal ultimately, because as you said, Cedric Price, but much more Lucius Burkhardt have been uh, forgotten. I mean, Lucius is really a totally unknown person to the youngest generation. But for Pierre and me, Lucius was a very important figure in the late 60s, early 70s, in the post-68 um, period. Um, because he introduced sociology, anthropology at the architecture school and um, everybody was very strongly politicized and politically uh, more interested in society than in architecture and so Lutus was a very interesting ingredient and um, uh, somewhat a driver of this um, social interest and gladly we've had him on our way to become architects and gladly also he then was kicked out of the school because then at, after two years we wanted to start doing architecture and then Aldo Rossi came in who was also a very important um, teacher for us so both Lucius who totally rejected um, architecture as let's say a first instrument to solve uh, a social pro uh, a problem, um, but we kept him as a, as, a, um, as a very important thinker and also as someone who um, introduced the doubt in, in our understanding of uh, how a city works, how architecture works, but gladly we also later had then this um, influence of Aldo Rossi also in Venice left his traces as you, as you know. Um, so I say this because many people know that Aldo Rossi was very important for a whole generation of architects, but very few know that Lucius was also very important for a whole generation of architects. And I think the interesting thing about the concept here that was, as you said, Hans Ulrich, um, generated, inspired, imagined by really this group of um, Herzog de Moreau as architects, but much more by the uh, artists that you mentioned, namely uh, Osotino Segal, um, the interesting thing is, I think, that it's a performative um, installation. It's not purely a physical, static installation, but it involves young people. And I think that's really very interesting that not only these young people are needed to um, communicate the ideas of Lucius, but they themselves will carry on on their way the kind of thinking of Lucius and, and uh, Cedric Price. So it's really quite an ingenious concept of, of um, spreading those ideas, not by once consuming them, but you inspire a whole group of people who are almost like um, prophets 
that they can carry it on. And in this case, I think it's a very interesting message they carry on because it's non-ideological, because it's more about thinking, about doubting, about looking, uh, all attributes that we believe are very strongly needed and are very important um, for the understanding of um, art, architecture, but also the whole world. It's a very ecological uh, kind of thinking. Uh, what else could I say? Yes, this kind of ecology of not doing more than needed, of just using what is needed to, um, um, to resolve a problem is at the heart of Lucio's book at thinking. And that's why also we like, and I speak also in the name of Pierre in this very much, the artist's contribution. I think they are really great because I think the whole concept is not just about a collaboration between architects and ar artists, because very often that doesn't work and it's just a kind of a blah blah. But I think it's really amazing how all these different wheels go together and make it a very simple, very natural installation. How the stores go up and down are absolutely needed so the whole thing works. And the stores were there and were not something that was brought and was not an invention of an ingenious artist but comes from thinking and perceiving rather than producing. And I think in this respect the whole installation is really very much created in the spirit of both Lucius and um, Cedric Price. Oh, the boards. Um, I mean, all that is physical is relatively unimportant. Some of the um, many drawings, uh, articles, um, prostate action, um, um, uh, protest actions, um, activities of all kinds are printed on boards via Xerox and via uh, facsimile, all these kind of um, techniques that Lucius liked so much because he liked cheap ways to communicate and easy ways to communicate. And they are leaning against the walls, they can be brought in and out, so they are not like uh, um, paintings. They don't have this kind of art, artistic uh, value. They are very random and they can be mounted and distributed in many ways and be stored away um, easily. And also it's a way that we work ourselves in our studio um, to quickly um, um, illustrate or, or represent some ideas. Jacques Herzog, thank you very much for this insight into the development of the exhibition. Now, Maya Hoffmann, you have been in an intense dialogue with us for quite some time to um, enable us um, with your contribution to realize all these ideas about a dramaturgy um, uh, which is constantly moving and developing and, and really having this moving element in it. So um, I'm very happy to let you talk about your motivation and your engagement in the project. Um, yeah, well, this is um, not so easy to talk now. Um, I really um, am with the Luma Foundation. We, since um, a few years actually, we are really trying to understand more how to present and display exhibitions in different ways and implying movement. Um, it is, uh, in this case, everything what uh, Hans Ulrich and, uh, and uh, Jacques said, I can uh, not agree more. I don't want to be redundant. I could read you maybe the text in the, in the preface, but uh, you, it is right, maybe not going to bring you many more elements. Maybe it's just important to know that we, uh, at the same time, and with a lot of the same actors, with the same uh, um, curators, with the same thinkers among our co-group in the Luma Foundation, and with the artists who are in the center of it all, also having an exhibition with movement and architecture. And when Hans Ulrich came with the project, I unfortunately had no, uh, no way because we were super busy on our sites to speak with Jacques or Pierre about it. But 
when, they, when Hans Ulrich came, we thought this really has to happen also with our support because I, ever since I know Hans Ulrich, I heard about Cedric Price and the Fern Palace and also about Lucius Burkhardt who, and his promenade and his astrology. How do you say this uh, also in French? Promenadologie or, yeah, yeah he was calling it in the same way. But it was not always so easy to find the translations in French. So there's not many more elements that I can bring to you. Of course, I had prepared my thank yous to everybody who has been participating in this show. And uh, what was interesting with, uh, with, uh, with uh, Cedric Price and with uh, um, Lucius Burkert is that I actually had their fields, sociology, architecture, and urbanism, which is already something very appealing because it's not always used in the same, uh, in the same specialty, if I, I can say so. so. And both of them insisted on forms of creativity which were more subtle, more personal, and more mobile than what surrounded them. And I think this was triggering them to, in their research. So the Swiss Pavilion in 2014, by doing this today, uh, means that they rethink the architectural exhibition in that way. And when Hans Ulrich Obrist uh, just invites the, this extraordinary group of artists, architects, thinkers, and all the other contributions, I think the exhibition is, is really uh, something that I invite you to experience a lot. I'm now speaking more to the, to the public than to the press. I think the press has more. So I have my thanks very shortly with Lorenza. Thank you, Lorenza, yeah, because it's great to, to work with you. Stefano Burry, of course, Herzog de Meuron, Pro Helvetia, the Atelier Bauau, Olafur, Eliasson, who did the piece that you can see on this wall. Atelier Bauau, I said already, Dominique, Dominique Gonzalez Furster, who is all, also here, then Graham, Carsten Höhler, Ku Jung Ei, and the, I'm also super interested to have the same group who is working on our exhibition which is still on in Arles and which is going to be on until uh, the end of September, uh, called Solaris Chronicle. I invite you also to find some materials outside about this exhibition. It's uh, in, a, in, a very, um, in a very subtle way. It is actually the continuation of the research which you can find here, but it is also uh, completely the beginning of, the, the, of, of this. So, this Swiss pavilion with Pro Helvetia is really, really completely in our line. Um, Liam Gillig, Philippe Parano, Parino, Asad Raza, and Tino Segal are in the show in Arles. And uh, it is in, a displaying models of uh, Frank Gehry who really uh, let us use this, these models. And um, I feel very honored to, to support experimental projects. And uh, I hope this is all coming together at some point also in your minds. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody here. So, thank you very much, Maya Hoffmann, Jacques Kertok, and Hans Ulrich Oprist for this first stroll through a fun palace. You will explore more later. And now it's up uh, to you, Sandy. So, uh, one more thing I would like to add to all this. Thank you all very much. I don't know how many of you know that Switzerland is in a very lucky situation here in Venice, but we don't only have a pavilion here, but we also have a beautiful place at the Palazzo Trevisan, which is at the Tatere. And as we started three years ago, this year again, we will have our collateral program happening there. This is uh, going to be open with an event this Saturday morning, 11 o'clock. It's called the Salon Swiss. And this year is created by Hiromi Hosoya and Markus Schäfer, urban researchers and architects uh, from Zurich, Switzerland. So I would also like to invite you to join us there on Saturday. Um, last but not least, um, I've seen some uh, very beautiful t-shirts uh, in the crowd here, which carry the name, actually the title of our show. They have been designed 
by Agnes B. together with Rick Ritironia. A um, great contribution, maybe you've seen it already further out there. And there's also been a reprint on a very beautiful publication on Cedric Price. So, uh, so now we would like uh, to give you the opportunity, if the journalists here have any question, uh, just to ask. And we have this microphone which will be passed around. And then if there are questions, please feel free to ask, uh, hear us. Uh, whatever you want to know. Okay. Um, I'm Sarah Penner from the Dutch newspaper, the Volkskrant. My question is for Mr. Uh, Herzog. Do you hear it? Yes? You. Ah, sorry for this. Actually, my question is not about this pavilion, but about the Biennale in general. I would really like to know your opinion about um, the theme of going back to the elements, leaving the architects out talking about architecture and your reaction to the Elements exhibition, please. Well, basically, I think it's a great idea, but I haven't been to the show yet, so I cannot say anything. I have to see it first. <laughs> well, we always try to go back to the Elements in every project. But as I said, I can't say anything about the show because I haven't seen it. It would be ridiculous. It would be really the opposite of... Uh, you know, being fundamental. But um, I think it's, as I said, I think it's really, I'm really keen to see how something works that normally is based on individual contributions. And I think it's uh, very interesting for once. And the Biennale, I think, is an opportunity to do, to look at the world from a different angle every two years. The curator has a possibility to do that. And uh, I think it's important that we do this in a, as radical way as possible. And whether it's successful or not is something I cannot say because, I, as I said, I haven't seen it yet. I'm Eda Mazatic from the Trans Magazine of the ETH Architecture School. Um, I would like to ask uh, um, either uh, Mr. Herzog or Mr. Obrist, um, how would you describe the relationship between the opus of Lucius Burkhardt, um, which, as you said, emphasizes the, the invisible aspects of architecture and the overall topic of the biennial, which is uh, about the, the, the elements of architecture in their very technolo technology and materiality. Do you see it as oppositional or is it more complementary? Both Lucius Burkhardt? You mean both Lucius Burkhardt and Cedric Price or more? Uh, as really emphasizing these anthropological and sociological aspects which are, which are crucial to his work. And I think it would be great to hear more from Jacques about this because obviously uh, uh, him having spent so much more time with Lucius than me, he'd have mu much more deeper things to say. But I mean, for me, I met Lucius relatively late in his life and, you know, we, we did a lot of walks in, in, uh, in exhibition. I think that a lot of his research is, I mean, looking at the drawings, preparing... For the, for the Biennale here, it feels as if these drawings were made today because many of the themes are so incredibly contemporary. I mean, the way how he looks at the environment, the way he looks at ecology, the way he looks at, you know, so, social dimensions of architecture is just very, very relevant for now. I think also the many dimensions of Lucius Burkhardt's work because I think, you know, looking at the archive, we have to wonder which Lucius Burkhardt we're talking about. There is obviously a Lucius Burkhardt, you know, curator, who editor of, of, of magazines, of, of, of work, and so somebody who really, you know, published big parts of the avant-garde of his generation and the research of his generation, Lucius Burkhardt as a teacher, somebody who invented with the uh, canapé, you know, a radical pedagogical model, similarly to Cedric Price, who invented the pottery think belt, you know, as a uh, something Mirko, um, you know, and, uh, and the CCA and the archive have many documents about, you know, and uh, at the same time, uh, you know, Lucius Burkhardt, as a, as a writer, as a philosopher, Lucius Burkhardt, as an urbanist, Lucius Burkhardt, as a landscape architect. So it's almost like many parallel realities. I think what is interesting is that they both, both Cedric and Lucius, have a great interest in these many things which have not to do with buildings, which are relevant for, for our lives and our cities. For example, as Lucius once told me, if you look at the building, it's not only the concrete. What happens between the neighbors is as important as the concrete. Um, or, you know, what Eddie Rama told us earlier today, uh, you know, how actually all of a sudden a conversation can start just by painting, you know, 
the, uh, the city in different colors, and that's something which could almost be a Cedric Price project. And he developed these early museum discussions by having numbers and heights on buildings. You know, in Glasgow and Sheffield, he developed unreal, you know, sort of almost like happenings which made people experience the city in a, in a different way. I think the connection to technology both, you know, in a very interesting way had a sort of a connection to technology. And particularly with Cedric, it's almost uncanny how much he anticipated the internet. And I think that has to do with the fact that he worked a lot with Gordon Pask and, you know, the Cyber Edition, uh, and that brought him to think about network conditions. And both, both in the Lucius and in the Cedric drawings, there's a lot, a lot about networks. But I'm sure Jacques can tell us much, much more. No, no, I, I think it's a good question. Uh, at first sight, it's totally the opposite, you know, and uh, that's probably why you asked this question, that fundamentals tries to really um, talk about what is the, the basis of, of the fundament of architecture. And Lucius, of course, in his early phase, uh, not in the late phase, uh, suddenly was trying to speak about other things, or the focus was on other things than architecture as architecture. And, um, but, as you said, Hans Ulrich, when we looked at his whole collection of documents, he has a huge collection of slides of the old style, with the most beautiful pieces of architecture and architecture history. Um, of the world, you know, in Europe, but also Asia, and, um, and all the things that you find in art historian um, archives. So in some way, really tracing back the real history and the fundaments of architecture. So he was knowledgeable about, about it, but he was never really actually speaking about that. And also, you know, the idea, I think there is an, an interesting link to Rams exhibition here, particularly the central exhibition in the in the pavilion in the in the Giardini, because somehow it's this idea of information, and we have more and more information, and information exponentially grows every day, but that not necessarily means that we have more memory. Uh, as Ram Kolas once said, maybe amnesia is very much at the core of the digital age, and it's kind of fascinating, you know, when Herzog. Demeron and their teams in Basel and we went together to the library, you know, and, and looked at the documents and then there was a very systematic way of capturing the material to just discover these hundreds and hundreds of forgotten unknown projects which are relevant for now. There is a staggering amnesia in the middle of this information explosion. In an interesting way, you know, walking through the central pavilion the other day with Ram, I felt there is almost in every room another Lucius Burkhardt. You know, there is the invent, this incredible research about stairs. Somebody in Germany who made five decades of research of stairs I had never heard about. There is the, re, you know, the, re, the discovery of these archives of windows of an English encyclopedist who has you know, thousands of windows, another unknown collection. It's this incredible you know, pioneer of corridors. There is, of course, the pioneer of the oblique. He's more known, Claude Parent. But in some kind of way, you know, I think almost in every room in the central pavilion, you can find another Lucius Burkhardt. So this idea, I mean, Eric Hobsbawm once said, we, we need a protest against, he said that in the Serpentine Marathon, and Julia Peyton Johnson and I had invited, he said, you know, we need a protest against forgetting in the digital age, in the information explosion. It's also very human to forget, gladly, I must say. Um, you've been talking about the pavilion becomes a research center. So, what a research is thinking, you think about aims or no aims, but um, are there any documentations about in, in, in the end? If you have, then the, the, the pavilion is a, like a process that is all becoming every day is a different day, is a different uh, collaboration, a different uh, communications between the students and the visitors. And in the end, there's a, you ask half a year, so you're having a, a research documentation or something like we can stand on and say, okay, we look back on this, what we had. It's a very interesting question also because there are going to be, you know, many, many different results, of course, of this research. On the one hand, you have the ETA students, you have the Venetian, you know, participants as well. Uh, you have the international, you know, summer academy participants, and they will find lots of findings about the archive and then permanently live, you know, transmitted also to 
um, to the visitors in the pavilion. So that you know is a feedback loop, and uh, every single visitor you know who visits the pavilion will somehow you know uh, find out things here, and you know that's then out in the world. You know at the same time, uh, many many you know students, young architects, artists, scholars, you know. Uh, get into the work here of Cedric Price and, and, um, and Lucius Burkhardt and what exactly is going to come out? Will there be many theses? Will there be books? You know, it's not for us to determine, uh, to determine, but there will be, you know, obviously a lot of results coming out. There is also an archive, you know, everything will be, you know, documented. There are going to be many, many talks here, but there is also a connection to the to the Biennale and to actually not to, the, to what's happening in the Arsenale because interestingly enough the idea obviously you know uh, the, the Fan Palace idea plays a role also in the design of the Arsenale because there are these smaller and bigger lecture theatres injected into the Arsenale so many of the results of the findings in dialogue with the Biennale from the Swiss Pavilion will then be presented as public events in the Arsenale. There's not one result, hopefully. You know, there's going to be many, many results. And there's, you know, going to be um, books, hopefully not one book, but many books. So this is a book machine. So thank you very much. I have to say, finally, it was such a great honor for us from Pro Helvetia to work together with all of you. I think the project is fantastic and uh, uh, this is, yeah, the end of the press conference.